Let's take the derivative of this function h of x using the chain rule. And this function is e raised to the power 5x cubed minus 2x plus 3. Notice that that entire term there is inside of the exponent. That whole thing is what e is being raised to. Okay, So we identify that piece as the inside function. We're going to call it g of x. So g of x is 5x cubed minus 2x plus 3. On the other hand, what happens to it? What's the outside function? We plug that inside function into the exponential function. We just raise e to that power. So this time the outside function, which we'll call f, following the notation I used for the chain rule, that's just raising whatever the input is using the variable name u for shorthand, raising e to that power u. It's the exponential function. Okay, so by recognizing these parts of the function as inside and outside, we've decomposed f as a composition of functions. Check it out. h is exactly f of g of x, where f and g are these two pieces. So next up, we're going to apply the chain rule. What does the chain rule say? Well, in general, it says that the derivative of a composite, like h, is given by the derivative of the outside function, that would be f prime, evaluated at the inside function g. So I've plugged g, not g prime, but just g, into the derivative of the outside function. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. That's what the chain rule says. Now, what is that in our particular example here? Well, what's the derivative of the exponential function with respect to its input variable u? It is its own derivative. So this f prime is again the exponential function. Let's observe that here, just so you can follow along. The derivative of f with respect to u is just again e to the u. So in other words, we need to evaluate the exponential function at g of x. All right, so I'm plugging g of x into the exponential function. Oh, hey, that's what we started with, right? So actually, we have a copy of the original function sitting here on the page. It's e to the power of 5x cubed minus 2x plus 3. That's what we get if we evaluate the derivative of the exponential at g of x. But we're not done. We need to multiply by that g prime of x. Okay, that's the next part. What's the derivative of g prime? Well, g prime is just 5x cubed minus 2x plus 3. That's a nice polynomial function. We can just use the power rule. So I'm going to go ahead and immediately do that here down below. I bring down the 3 and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So 5 times 3x squared minus the derivative of 2x. That's just 2. The derivative of 3, that's 0. So the derivative of the inside function is just 5 times 3x squared minus 2. Okay, So I've applied the chain rule here by carefully using the derivative of f, the original function g of x, and g prime of x for each of those parts of the formula. And now that we have our function, uh, we can simplify a little bit. But honestly, there's not so much to do. We're pretty much just going to be writing it down again. It's again e to the 5x cubed minus 2x plus 3. And now we're multiplying that. We can multiply the 5 and the 3 together to get 15, but that's about it. That's the derivative. Copy. 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 Next example, let's take the derivative of 4 raised to the power cosine of t. The first step is to recognize the inside and the outside of this composition. What are the two steps? In what order are they happening? So this time, the inside function, I'm going to use a, a slightly different notational technique this time, just to show you 
all the different ways that you can think about it, the inside function is cosine of t. Instead of writing that as the function g, I'm just going to think of it as that variable u. Okay, That's the inside function. All right. What's the outside function? What happens after you take cosine of t? Well, you raise 4 to that power. And I'm going to think of that as the variable y. So 4 raised to the power u, that's the second process. That's the outside function. Groovy. Now let's take the chain rule. And I'm going to write down a general formula for the chain rule, this time using Leibniz notation. I really want to practice using the chain rule using lots of different notations. So in Leibniz notation, the derivative of y with respect to t is the derivative of y with respect to the intermediary variable u times the derivative of u with respect to t. Okay. So before, it was dy over dx is dy du times du dx, but here it's a function of t, so I'm using t in place of x. So that's a general formula for the chain rule. Let's apply it here. In this example, it would say that the overall derivative of the entire function is given by, now what would dy du be? dy du, that's the derivative of 4 to the u. Okay, how do we take the derivative of 4 to the u? It's not the power rule, that's an exponential function, but with base 4 instead of base the natural logarithm. So in other words, it is its own derivative, but multiplied by the natural log of 4, this fudge factor which accounts for the base of the, net, of the exponential that we're using. Now at this point, I could write 4 to the u, and actually, why don't I do that? that is the derivative of 4 to the u. We'll plug in for u in the next step. So that right there, that's the first part. That's the dy by du. And next up, we're going to multiply by the uh, du by dt. u is cosine of t, right? So we need to multiply by the derivative of cosine. The derivative of cosine is minus sine. So that multiplication, that is multiplying by the du dt term. So I'm using the same formula as before. I've just plugged in for these two derivatives. And now we're all good to go, except, except we can't leave the answer in terms of u. That was just some dummy variable we made up, right? So before we finish, we have to plug the inside function, not its derivative, but the inside function in for u. Okay, what happens when we do that? I'm going to keep everything else the same so that you can see. When we do that, we get natural log of 4 times 4 raised to the power u, but we're plugging in u equals cosine of t. That inside function is just itself. It is the variable u, but expressed in terms of t. And then again, we're multiplying by the derivative of the inside function, which is minus sine of t. There you go. All right, now we're done the functions entirely in terms of t. We could stop at this point if we wanted to. I'm at least going to move this minus sign out to the front since everything's being multiplied. I can do that. And so here is the derivative. It's minus the natural log of 4 times 4 to the cosine t times sine of t. You might ask yourself, why does the chain rule work? It's just some complicated formula that my math professor gave me and told me to use to compute derivatives. I don't think that we should just blindly accept truth from authority without understanding why it's true. So I want to give you some indications for 
why the chain rule works. I'll actually give a proof for you later on in the course, probably next week. But for now, I just want to explain via an example, which is using the system of gears. Okay, so what's going on here? We have three different gears. The X gear is turning that way, and that drives the U gear turning the opposite direction, which is driving the Y gear turning back counterclockwise again. And as you can see, each of these gears has uh, fewer teeth than the next one. I know they kind of look like saws, but, but imagine like a system of gears all interlocking and, and driving each other. Okay, so let's say that this gear has 36 teeth, 36 little notches. And let's suppose that the next gear, the U gear, has 18 teeth, half as many teeth as the X gear. And finally, the Y gear uh, has six teeth, one-third as many teeth as the U-gear. So now check it out, we're going to be thinking about how many revolutions each of these gears makes for one revolution of the X-gear. Right. Here we go. So, since the X-gear has two times as many, oh, that looks like a 2x, I mean like two times. Maybe I should write it out using words, huh? Twice, that's the word that we use. <laughs> the X gear has twice as many teeth, as many notches, as the U gear for each revolution of the X gear, the U gear goes around two times. Okay. On the other hand, uh, we have a similar relationship between the U gear and the Y gear. Before I get to that, I actually want to encode this into mathematical notation. I want to think of this as a derivative type of notation. We can actually think of this as a rate of change. Right? If we're thinking about the speed of the U gear with respect to the X gear, I mean like the speed of this outer perimeter. It's, it's how fast it's rotating, right? It's rotating rotating twice as fast, right? Because for each revolution of the X gear, the U gear goes around two times. So the total range of, rate, the total rate of change of U with respect to X would be two. U goes around twice for every one time that X goes around. The rate of change of the U gear with respect to the X gear is two. All right, same story with the Y and U. Because the Y gear has t six teeth and the U gear has 18 teeth for each revolution of the U gear, the Y gear goes around three times. Right? Because three times six is 18, it takes three times going around all those teeth three times going all around the teeth on the Y gear to get all the way around the U gear. In other words, as the U gear is being propelled by the X gear, each revolution of the U gear gives you three revolutions of the Y gear. If we can interpret that as a derivative, that's saying that the rate of change of the Y gear with respect to revolutions of the U gear is three. It's spinning around three times as fast. Now, check it out. For each revolution of x, the u goes around twice. But then for each revolution of u, the y goes around three times. Therefore, for each revolution of x, 
how many times does Y go around? Well, as the year gear goes around twice, each of those revolutions of U gives you three for the Y gear. So it's two times three for each revolution of X. The Y gear goes around two times three, which is six times. All right, and I claim that that is the chain rule. What is this expression? This is just saying that two, which was d over dx times three, which is dy over du, is equal to six. That would be the rate of change of the y gear with respect to the original x gear. Okay. So this principle, this idea, is the chain rule. All right. We wrote that in a slightly different way. Uh, I think the order is a little bit swapped. The equation is uh, swapped. So I can rewrite that as dy dx is writing dy du team first, and then the du dx term second. It's the same equation, right? I'm just changing the order up a bit. That gives us the chain rule. So this example illustrates why the chain rule is true. If you have a two-step process going from X gear to U gear and then from U gear to Y gear, the rates of change early on in the process, the speed of that X gear, it's being amplified up. It's multiplicative. Changes in U with respect to X are amplified. They're multiplied by the changes in Y with respect to U to account for the overall rate of change of Y with respect to X. Next up, let's compute the derivative of the function q of x. It's given by secant of x plus 1 over x cubed, all raised to the fourth power. And you might think, oh no, we need to multiply this out and foil it four times. No, 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 no. We're just going to use the chain rule. It's actually not going to be that bad. First of all, let's recognize that that entire expression, that's the inside function. Okay. I recognize that because the final thing that happens in the order of operations is raising that whole thing to the fourth power. So the inside function is the thing which is being raised to the fourth power. Let's use the f and g notation again, just to practice that. All right, that's the, out, the inside function, g of x. What's the outside function? It's what's being done to the inside function. So here the outside function would be that second step of the process. Let's write that using f. And in terms of an auxiliary variable u, it's just raising u to the fourth power. Right? If I think of g of x as outputting to the u variable, I'm just raising u to the fourth power. OK, let's apply the chain rule. The chain rule says the derivative of the composite is the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside function times the derivative of the inside function. Very good. How does that work out in this case? Here we go. Let's see if we can do it all in one fell swoop. What's the derivative of f of u? Well, that would be 4 times u cubed, using the power rule. Ah, heck, I always make mistakes if I try to do too many things at once. So let me actually write down that derivative. It's a good idea. Less liable to make mistakes that way. The derivative of f with respect to u is just 4u cubed. OK, so that's going to be the f prime. But what am I plugging into f prime? I'm plugging in g of x. So in other words, you might like thinking about it this way. I can write the inside as just g of x for a second. It's going to end up being this whole thing. But before I do that, I'm just going to think about plugging g of x into this f prime function. See what I mean? And then we're multiplying by the derivative of g. Well, 
g here is uh, secant plus 1 over x cubed. Uh, let's, let's not get into that. Let's actually just leave it as g prime for now. I'm going to show lots of steps in this example. I like showing how you use the chain rule in many different ways. The more ways that you see how a computation can be done, the more likely you are to find a method, a notation that we're... That's important. All right, let's plug in the formula for g of x here. g of x is by definition secant plus 1 over x cubed. There you go. I'm um, Just plug it in where g of x was above. And now we need to take the derivative of g. So in other words, we're going to end up taking the derivative of secant of x plus 1 over x cubed. Uh, 1 over x cubed, to take its derivative, we should think of it as x to the minus 3 and use the power rule. So let me write it that way. Okay, uh, now this first term, there's not really anything we can do at this point. I don't see any purpose in multiplying it all out. Let's just leave it like that. So since we're not going to do any more to it, let me switch back to black ink for that part. And now we're going to take the derivative of secant plus x to the minus 3, okay? What's the derivative of the secant function? It's secant of x times tangent of x. We found that earlier using the chain rule, right? Because secant is 1 over cosine, so if you use the chain rule there, you'll get secant times tangent. How do you take the derivative of x to the minus 3? You use the power rule. You bring the minus 3 down, you subtract 1 from the exponent like so. So there's the derivative of the inner function in its full glory being multiplied afterwards. Beautiful. And uh, now we're done. The only thing I can really see to do is, you know, maybe write this as minus 3 x to the minus 4. And I guess to kind of match this, we could put the x to the minus 4. We could write that as just over x to the 4, put it in the denominator. Let's do that. That sounds nice. Okay. So here's the derivative. It's 4 times secant of x plus 1 over x cubed raised to the third power times secant of x tangent of x minus 3 over x to the fourth. Beautiful. Am I right? Am I wrong? You may say to yourself, Max!